Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of the Virginia Association of Wetland Professionals, we're so happy to see your interest in the Professional Wetland Delineator Certification Program. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to send them in the chat and we will address them at the end. So let's start off by thanking our sponsors. Uh, thank you to Wetland Studies and Solutions, Dramby Environmental Consulting, Stantec, and Town Site Engineering. We appreciate your contributions so we can provide this webinar to our membership. We have four panelists today. We're going to be discussing different aspects of the PWD program. I'm Alexi Weber, the Assistant Manager of Environmental Science at Wetland Studies and Solutions in Gainesville. We have Ted Kraska, Director of Environmental Services at Town Site Engineering, Ricky Woody, Senior Project Manager at Stantec, and Eli Wright, Senior Environmental Scientist at Dramby Environmental Consulting. So we have a lot of great information to share today. We'll have six topics to cover that are pertinent to the certification. So we're going to review the program history and background, required qualifications, how to apply, what general categories are included on the examination, and then how to maintain your certification and the standards of practice and conduct. So Ricky will get us started off. Thank you, Lexi. I was gonna talk about the program background. Uh, we're gonna talk about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineator Certification Program, the, S, the uh, SWS Wetland Certification Program, and the Association of Wetland Managers. Uh, we'll start out with the uh, Corps Delineator Program. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we're gonna start uh, where we all need to know where we begin is it was uh, started in 1972 with the Clean Water Act and also the Virginia Wetlands Act. Um, actually in 1975, the definition of waters EDS was redefined to include navigable waters, non-navigable interstate waters, uh, and also freshwater wetlands. And then in 1977, they came in with the legal definition of wetlands. And which, as you know, that as of March 20th, there was a new rule in effect However, on April 12th, the federal judge temporarily blocked uh, that rule to go, go into effect, and that, that st we were one of the states uh, where that is. So really, the de demonstrates the importance of what the definitions of waters of the U.S. is to our program and the need for our professional wetland delineation certification. One of the major challenges to that definition was in 1985, the Riverside Bayview Homes versus U.S., and it really went to adjacent wetlands and flooding by adjacent navigable waters. And then in the, and so as a follow-up in 1987, it was the original wetland manual that everything is based on, and it created the three-legged stool, the hydric soils, the hydrophytic vegetation, as well as wetland hydrology. Again, in 1989, the Corps was trying to uh, enhance the 87 manual, but it was very short-lived and later rescinded because there was concerns that it really heavily weighted on vegetation and it didn't really address the ephemeral waters issues. And then 1990, based on the information, the Corps of Engineers looked at creating their own delineation certification program. However, there were so many substantial regional differences that that program was also terminated. Again, another reason what the, the need for the professional wetland delineation certification was needed in Virginia. And so now I'll turn it over to Ted to, to talk about the, uh, Thank you, Ricky. All right. So in 1994 and 1995, the Society of Wetland Scientists took its shot to create the National Wetland Certification Program. Now, originally, there were three options, the PWS, the WIPIT, or Wetland Professional in Training, and the Delineator. Shortly after its inception, the Delineator designation was dropped. Um, due to basically the similar regional differences the core certification program faced across the U.S., Today, the PWS and WIPIT designations remain and are strong with thousands of registered members, um, and the, but the program does remain uh, academia and educational based. Applications to become a PWS or a WIPIT levels uh, do not require proof of field delineation skill or practice. Uh, next slide, please. So, 
what certifications do exist that require field skills? Well, you're here because of the PWD program here in Virginia. However, Virginia is not the only state program, nor was it the first state program to exist. New Hampshire, Minnesota, and Wisconsin also have state programs of varying degrees. New Hampshire is actually the first, uh, and they have currently about 186 active members that are certified professional level and scientists. A New Hampshire PWS certification is required for delineation within that state, and applicants take both a written and a field test for certification. In Minnesota's program, uh, they have a wetland delineator certification similar to that of Virginia's uh, upon path with just a written exam. They have about 301 PWDs and another 227 wetland professionals in training. Wisconsin's program is fairly new um, and it's a little different. Uh, they've got about 40 registered members, but whereas it's not a true delineator certification, it's a program to provide professional assurance. Uh, to the construction regulatory community. Now here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we've got about 200 active PWDs. Um, approximately 125 of those are actually active and maybe another 80 are actually physically practicing delineation on a regular basis. So how did we get here? Well, the VDAWP, which was created back in 1994, noticed along with the regulatory community that several projects uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s were being done with poor quality delineations. The VAWP members then led the charge to seek a certification program at the state level. Finally, in the summer of 2004, legislation was officially signed that established a certification program. The first exam for the PWD in Virginia was were issued in Richmond in the fall, and the first certification, including yours truly, were issued in November of 2004. Uh, the program has subsequently been updated uh, and amended in 2006, 2007, and 2015. Uh, one of those um, amendments included the uh, the removal of a grandfathering clause that allowed people with 10 plus years of delineation experience uh, to automatically be certified. So next slide, please. So, yes, the PWD is a, technically a voluntary certification. It is not required to obtain a core jurisdiction determination. It is, however, administered by the Department of Professional Occupation and Regulation, which you'll, which you'll hear more of from uh, Eli and others, uh, which issues credentials, licenses, and certifications for a plethora of regulated professionals in various fields across the state. Specifically, the Board of Professional Soil Scientists, Wetland Professionals, and Geologists has consists of three soil scientists, geologists, three wetland professionals, and three citizen members. Now there is also, you can see there is a regulatory framework associated with it and within the Code of Virginia section 54.1-2200, uh, it's associated with PWDs and more importantly, that framework helps, it specifies that certified wetland professionals are defined as having special knowledge of wetland science and methods and principles of wetland delineation as acquired by both education experience and the formation and mapping the wetlands. So while you can see that this is also a great marketing tool to provide clients, the PWD really sort of uh, is there to help uh, clients, developers, and regulators uh, have that comfort level that you are qualified to delineate wetlands, uh, both non-title and title, uh, throughout the throughout the old dominion. So, but be forewarned. While the PWD is voluntary right now, uh, there are uh, that that may change in the next few years. Uh, Department of Environmental Quality is looking to implement a state waters determination program. One half of that certification will require an individual have a PWD uh, with the Commonwealth. So, how do you join this wonderful group? So Eli Wright next is going to carry things forward and introduce you to 
more about DPOR and the requirements for the PWD. Thanks, Ted. So, yeah, so here we're going to get into some of the, the meat and potatoes of PWD um, and, and talk about the, the overall qualifications. Next slide. So uh, what I've outlined here at the top for, for any of the uh, regulatory nerds out there who like getting into the, the meat and potatoes of, of regulations, um, you can kind of some citations at the top um, that you can see and, and dig into how this is all outlined and, and framed uh, within the regulatory context. But essentially, uh, the basic requirements to be a PWD is you have to be at least 18 years old, be of good moral character, have the experience that shows, as Ted had mentioned, that, that you uh, are a qualified wetland professional. And then you also need to pass an exam um, or obtain a waiver for the examination component. Uh, the waiver portion deals with uh, reciprocity with uh, other look, uh, other states that, like um, Ricky had mentioned, that have some of these certification programs. Uh, that, that's an unusual pathway. Most, you know, I would, I would say 95 plus percent of people who are uh, PWD have gone through the the examination component. So we really won't get into the waiver too much here, but that is an option uh, if you want to investigate that further to see if you may qualify. Next slide. So as far as the qualifying experience, uh, there's actually three pathways to demonstrate that you have that qualifying experience. Uh, the, probably the most common pathway I'm going to refer to is uh, A1. So this is outlined, and again, as you can see at the top here, that, that regulatory code. Um, the A1 uh, statute basically says that you need to have these three uh, um, qualifications in order to demonstrate that you have the experience. The first is that you need to have a relevant degree. Uh, the regulations outline specific degrees um, that, that do qualify, or you can demonstrate that you have an equivalent degree. Um, we'll get to that a, a little bit further down in the application process. The next requirement for this A, A1 option is to show that you've demonstrated having uh, wetland delineation training. Uh, this needs to be a 32-hour course that's approved by the, the wetlands board, um, the PWD board, sorry, and uh, demonstrate that that course had components that included the identification of vegetation, soil, and hydrology indicators, um, as well as a field component. So we're going to see this repeated throughout this conversation, uh, that those three parameters, um, what Ricky had you know, discussed is that the three-legged tool, those are going to be a consistent factor out here is demonstrating that, that all of your experience, training, education has had those, those components. The other piece of that is that also having a field component has been identified as an essential component showing the experience that you've actually been in the field, um, you know, identifying these, these different parameters. Finally, for this A1 option, it's uh, required to have four years of experience delineating. So the other two options, um, are outlined here as well. So we've got the A2 option, which is essentially you just need six years of delineation experience. If you qualify underneath that experience, you don't need to have the relevant degree and you don't need the delineation training specific component, 32 hour component. You can just have straight six years of, of delineation experience. Um, finally, the, the A3 option is basically the academic researcher uh, qualifications, being able to demonstrate that you have an academic experience doing research or teaching wetland curriculum uh, for at least four years of experience in that component. Fine. So here's, um, we're gonna start talking about the actual application requirements. How do you actually apply to become a PWD? And we wanted to go through this kind of in detail because uh, this can be a little bit of a cumbersome process. That it's quite a lot of details that need to be included in the application. So we wanted to go through this step-by-step step and explain how you demonstrate these various uh, experience components qualifications, your education, trainings, how do we put this all together in an application package? So this program is all, you know, th through the regulation is administered through D4, the Department of Professional and Occupation Regulation. All this information we're gonna be presenting is actually on the D4 website. Um, so we provide the links here and, and we'll be sure to get those in the chat uh, if folks are interested. So I uh, just wanted to, to also point out that, you know, these, these regulations go through regular reviews, um, you know, Congress, the state Congress meets and, and changes regulations. So these things change from time to time. So it's always important to make sure you're going to the website to find the most accurate and updated information. Uh, the information we're presenting today is, is what's accurate today, but just want to ensure that people know that that's important to, to check out the website um, to get the latest and greatest. So the overall process for the uh, application is outlined. Essentially, you prepare the application materials. Um, you submit your application along with the fee. 
And then the board, uh, the DPOR board, which um, you know can, uh, includes both the wetland professionals, soil scientists, and geologists, they review the application uh, and determine whether or not the application meets the qualification requirements. And, and from there, um, the board sends a letter and provides you with uh, an admission letter for the examination and uh, the fee to actually sit for the exam. Alternatively, you might be getting the exam waiver. Again, that's an unusual pathway, um, but it is it is something if you feel like you qualify for that, you can look into. Slide. So the application itself, um, these application packages, my understanding is that they're quite large. You know, they're uh, on the orders of hundreds of pages. So there's a lot of materials you need to combine and get together in order to to demonstrate all these various um, components of the, the minimal qualifications. So it's important to get ahead of this process as much as possible and, and get these things kind of in order um, as, you know, as soon as you're, you're recognizing that you want to qualify and sit for these, these exams and, and the um, certification. So the application itself, the full application package and all its various components need to be submitted to DPOR and actually received by DPOR at least 90 days before the next examination period. You can actually go on DPOR's website and they, they outline the, the various deadlines for all these things, but that's just something important to, to realize. If you're thinking you're wanting to take an exam, uh, say in November, just making sure that you, you get the application materials 90 days ahead of time submitted so that there's enough time for the board to review those materials. Um, there's also a uh, application fee of $90 that needs to be submitted with the application forms. And again, DPOR has all has various forms online um, that includes the actual application, references and likes we'll, we'll get into. It's important to make sure that you're filling out those, those forms that are available on DPOR's website. Right. So the, the first component of uh, the application is, is references. And this is getting back to that component that we talked about, one of the minimal qualifications is showing that you're a good moral character um, and, and meet these, um, you know, the qualifications for that component. So there's a standard DPOR, DPOR reference form. Um, these forms need to be completed by your references that are signed and sealed in an envelope. Your references can either submit these directly to DPOR and there's instructions for how to do that to make sure it's associated with your application, or they can return the sealed form to you and you can include that in your application package. To take a step back as well, with the application, DPOR has a physical address that they request that all these materials be sent to. So uh, that is something to keep in mind that these are physical documents you need to make sure you're getting sent. So the, uh, there are three references that you need to have. Um, all need to come from professional wet, uh, wetland professionals, all three of the references. At least one of those references needs to be an actual PWD. So try to keep that in mind that when you're identifying your references, one of them is a PWD. All the references also need to have at least known the applicant for one, a one-year period, and they have to uh, be able to demonstrate that they've they've seen your work basically as a, as a wetland professional. Um, important to also note is that the references that you use for these personal references for these, uh, cannot be the same as the reference that is used to demonstrate your experience. And we'll get into that in the next in the next slide here in a minute. But um, just just recognize that that is a separate person um, for that qualification. Finally, the references cannot actually be a relative of the applicant. The other component here for the de demonstrating good moral character is to show that you, uh, if you have any kind of disciplinary criminal record um, with the state or elsewise, if there's felonies and that likes, um, DPOR requests that you submit that information as part of the application and any mitigating circumstances that may be surrounding uh, the, those disciplinary criminal records. Fine. All right, so we're getting to the, to the actual education requirements. Um, so, the, so this is getting back to, if we're going back to those A1 through A3 options, we talked about demonstrating experience. The first one we're gonna talk about here is the A1 option. Um, so this is, again, having four years experience, uh, showing that you meet one of the relative uh, relevant um, bachelor degrees and that you have the associated training, wetland training. So for the education component, uh, you need to ensure that you're including a certified and official transcript uh, from, from your demonstrating that you meet that, that qualification for the bachelor's degree. Uh, and again, this needs to be an official transcript, so make sure that you're planning enough time to reach out to your institutions of higher education to get these documents. Sometimes it can take a while, especially if it's been a while since you've been out of school. Um, 
the other thing that you need to demonstrate here, particularly when it's coming to the, the relevant fields of your bachelor's degrees, is demonstrating that if, uh, you meet certain uh, equivalency hours in different educational components. So if, if your degree that you have doesn't necessarily meet one of the ones that are outlined in that regulatory context, um, you can demonstrate that you meet the qualifications by showing that you have what's outlined here, 15 hours of biological sciences, 15 hours of physical sciences, and six uh, semester hours of uh, qualitative sciences to help demonstrate that you meet that minimum criteria from the education side. The next component is the actual delineation training. So this is um, typically, you know, if you've taken any kind of delineation course uh, that has um, at least 32 hours, that, that helps to show the qualifications. You've actually had a specific training in, in delineation. Um, this can kind of be piecemeal if need be, if you've had a couple different courses, uh, that maybe one's done, I know VIMS does a regional supplement. Uh, for example, VOP has done the mineral flat workshops. Um, so you can kind of combine some of those different training opportunities to make sure that you've had at least 32 hours. The important thing is that for each of those trainings that you submit to meet this qualification, it has to have, again, that three-legged tool showing that there's been inclusion of discussion of vegetation, soils, and hydrology, uh, and a field component for those courses. Um, so to demonstrate that, you can combine your certifications that you have, uh, certificates of completions, and include that in your application. All right, so now we're getting into uh, the actual documentation of, of experience. So this applies, um, again, to, to any of the, the pathways that you're looking to apply for, whether you're applying A1 through A3, you need to show that you've had some kind of qualifying experience. So DPOR has an experience log form, again, on their website that you can download that basically out, that demonstrates how you've met those qualifications. Uh, in order for those forms to be submitted, you actually have to need a supervisor to sign off on those forms. Uh, the supervisor who oversaw your, your work as a wetland uh, delineator or professional. Uh, so, so again, this is important to remember, the supervisor who signs off cannot be one of the same references that you use for those, those three references. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're keeping that in mind when pulling these forms together. The other thing with these proof of uh, documenting your experience is being able to demonstrate to the board that you've actually had the experience. And this can be done in various ways, um, but it also often includes delineation reports, data sheets, field logs, um, if you're doing the A1 or A2 option. If you're doing the A3 option with the uh, research and scientific component, you might include research reports, scientific papers that may be considered acceptable documentation. Um, important to note is that, so, so in your application package, you're physically, you know, potentially printing these documents off um, and providing them as part of your application. So the, this is where a lot of the bulk of the material comes from. Um, you may end up with, with a lot of documents that shows various data forms, data sheets, um, and, and the likes. Uh, again, an important to note on this is the experience. Um, you know, if you're providing delineation reports, you don't necessarily have to include the entire report. There's a list of the minimum requirements. Uh, but you do have to make sure that the entire report is available by the board upon request. So something to keep in mind. Something else is just make sure you're not submitting originals. Once submitted, anything in the application package becomes the property of D4. So you won't be getting that returned to you. All right, so this is uh, talking again about the A1 and A2 options uh, as far as demonstrating experience from an actual uh, delineation, whether you've had the four years experience with the education component and the, the wetland course training, uh, or you're doing just the straight six years of experience. Um, for either of those options, you, you, really, yeah, you have kind of two, two ways to demonstrate the experience. The first one is probably, again, for most people, it's going to be the, the primary pathway, is showing the preparation of delineation reports. So for this, you have to show that you've done at least 10 delineations within the past 10 years. Um, and again, you have to show that you've done substantial amount of work on those delineations, including having a cover letter that shows that you were uh, one of the key uh, delineators and in data forms that also show that you were listed as the, the data collector on that data form. Six of the delineations have to uh, at least been a non-tidal wetlands. The board wants to show there's differences in delineating between tidal and non-tidal wetlands. Um, so at least six of the 10 need to be for non-tidal wetland sources. And again, each of those uh, delineations need to show that, demonstrate that you've used proper identification of vegetation, soil, and hydrology. 
The next option is actually for uh, essentially regulators and government officials who oversee delineation approvals. Um, there's a pathway in order for those folks to, to be able to become a BWD, showing that they've actually reviewed and inspected and confirmed at least 30 delineations. Again, those have to have been done in the last 10 years, demonstrating the three-legged stool that you reviewed three parameters. Uh, you also need to demonstrate with those uh, experience that you've actually went out and did a field verification component to that confirmation. Um, so again, it can't be like a desktop uh, review. It needs to actually have a field component associated with it. And at least six of those 30 delineations needed to be from, from non-title wetland sources to demonstrate qualifications. So, that, so that again, this is primarily for you know folks from uh, DEQ, the core, potentially folks like VDOT, I know they do some of their own uh, delineation confirmations, have an agreement with the core. You know, the, those, those are the types of uh, folks that might qualify underneath this category. So the last option um, is for, again, under that, applying under that A3 category, the research and uh, wetland teacher curriculum. So underneath that, if you're a researcher, you need to show that you've done at least three field studies um, that focused on wetland delineation practice and issues and show Again, the inclusion of uh, proper identification of veg vegetation, soil, and hydrology. The other option for, for an academic is to do the teacher wetland curriculum pathway. Uh, this, again, needs to show that you've had a minimum of six semester hours that have been taught in the past 10 years that uh, demonstrate that the curricula has um, a, a component of proper identification of the three, the three criteria. Um, and then this, academic researcher, or this academic uh, sorry, teacher portion needs to have been at an institution of higher education, so college, university level. Next slide. All right, so we've gone through all the various components of the application requirements. Um, and now, uh, essentially, once you get your application package together, you submit it to the board. What happens now? Um, the board has essentially, um, you have to get that again. I mentioned this previously, 90 days before the exam for them to provide it. Um, and then the board makes a decision whether or not the project, uh, or whether the application meets the, the criteria. And if they decide that you qualify, they will send you a, a letter in the mail that notifies you uh, of whether or not you qualify or not, the, the next dates of the exams, and they will provide information for paying an the examination fee, which is $150 and separate from the application fee. Uh, and give you information for, for actually um, sitting for the exam. At least five days before the exam, they'll send you an exam admissions letters, which you need to take with you to the exam, um, and, and it shows that you're qualified to sit for that. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Ricky, and he's going to talk about the examination process. Thank you, Eli. Now that we understand the application process, we'll move into the examination and what you can expect. Uh, as you move through the examination process. Next slide. Um, as, Eli, as Eli discussed uh, on the DPOR site, there's a candidate information bulletin and Ted will be providing a link for that. That really covers a lot of the good information that we are going over. It all begins with that admission letter. You will need to have that admission letter that Eli discussed uh, for when we start uh, out. There And then also you need to have one current and recognizable form of identification with your photograph and with a clearly signature. And also you'll be asked to sign an examination site conduct agreement uh, once you arrive. Also try to make sure you arrive uh, to the examination on, on time. There's unlimited parking in front of the building, so you shouldn't have any issues uh, with the parking. Next slide. So items, uh, what, what do I take? What items am I gonna need to use in the examination room? Well, first, the wetland delineation examination is a closed book examination. Also, you wanna bring number two pencils with an eraser. Make sure you look at that in the night before that you have that information or those pencils. Also, the calculators. The examiner will check your calculators. They need to be non-printing, battery operated, no word processing capabilities. And before, you wanna make sure it is confirmed and working properly. Also, there's no non-alcoholic beverages permitted in a closed container or, I mean, non-alcoholic beverages are permitted in the closed container, although I might need an alcoholic beverage uh, for, for showing up, but hey, we'll get there. And then it can be in a mug and a bottle, but any non-alcoholic drinks you bring, the drinks must be kept on the floor and not on the desktop during the examination. 
Uh, next slide, please. Other, uh, and so you question what might what might I not be able to bring? Well, you're not going to be allowed to have hats, caps, visors, shawls, or hooding. And again, no alcoholic beverages, as as I, as I mentioned before. Um, and then no electronic devices. So you want to leave those in your car or with somebody else. Uh, cameras, voice recorders, any kind of digital watches or computers. There's no tobacco products or electric smoking devices, no matter how nervous you might be, uh, or food or pens or highlighters or even good luck items uh, that will be given by people that will be supporting you when you go to take the exam. Also, the examiner, if they're noticed, they will collect it and any of those items till the end of the examination, and there'll be a written incident sent to the board documenting uh, the use of or the presence of any of those items they had to take. Next slide, please. So then you wonder, what about security guidelines? Uh, there's basically will be no visitors, the guests or children permitted in the examination room. Also, the, Com the Commonwealth of Virginia copyrights all the test questions, so it is unlawful to copy them, reproduce them, take any action to reveal the content of the examination in whole or part. Also, you'll be prohibited from removing the examination booklet, answer sheet, or any other confidential material required. Again, any irregularities, uh, active impersonation, having somebody show up to take the exam for you might be an example of that. Uh, creating a disturbance or giving or receiving any authorized information, uh, so no calling a friend, um, be allowed or removing any attempt, or you'll be asked to be or expelled from the examination room. And again, any irregularities will be reported to the board. The next slide, please. So now we actually get to the wetland delineator examination. It's going to be 100 multiple choice test questions and it's closed book. There will be a test to be three hours in length. So you wonder what is going to be there. So the current outline is there's going to be 15% questions on hydric soils, 15% on hydrophytic vegeta vegetation, 15% on wetland hydrology, and 15% on atypical uh, problem area situations. And also synthesis is 40%. And you ask, what is synthesis? It's actually the real world application to show problem solving skills, techniques, charts, graphs, maps, or situational groupings. It also shows the process and procedure you would follow by which an area is judged a wetland or non-wetland. And there will be questions to title and non-title concepts. Next slide, please. So now that you've completed the examination, the minimum score is 75. Um, also, guessing is to your advantage if you're unsecure. A blank answer is a wrong, is a it comes as a wrong answer. Um, also, you'll be notified of a passing to failing score approximately four weeks from the Office of Education. They will not reveal the number of the score that you received, just whether you passed or failed. And the examinations are confidential, and they will not be released over the phone. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, so to prepare for it, there's a lot of references, and we want to make sure you pull down the most current references, as Eli said, from the DPOR website to prepare for your examination. So you want to refer to the 1987 manual, which set the three-legged stool. You're also going to look at the regional supplements. What's in Virginia? We have two regional supplements um, that will be necessary, the Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain, as well as the Eastern Mountain and Piedmont regions. You'll need to understand the National Wetland Plant List. You will need to look at the field indicators and have a knowledge of Munsell Soil Color Charts and the Coward and Classification System, as well as the Code of Virginia Wetland Guidelines, or some of the few references as well to supplement your uh, on-site knowledge and experience. Next slide. And so I will turn this over to Lexi to discuss certification maintenance. Thank you, Ricky. So let's get started on certification maintenance. So the PWD is pretty easy to maintain. You don't have any continuing education requirements. It expires two years from the last day of the month in which it was issued and DPOR will notify you uh, within that 30 days. The renewal fee is $70. If you pay after the 30 calendar days, there are extra fees associated with it. But if you let your certification lapse for one year or longer, you are going to apply as a new applicant and you'll have to retake the exam. So we'll review the standards of practice and conduct. So as a certified PWD and under the Code of Virginia, you'll have to uphold these 10 standards of practice and conduct that are outlined on this slide. 
But really to summarize these standards at a certified PWD, you have to provide the correct technical knowledge, skill, and terminology during wetland delineations, plan approval, plan and report review, and professional opinions. And lastly, as a certified PWD, you're not allowed to use anyone else's work without their prior consent. So with this certification and under the Board of Virginia, um, any unprofessional conduct as outlined in this slide is subject to disciplinary action by the board. And unprofessional conduct also includes representing yourself as a certified PWD if you're not actually certified by the board. So our next exam will occur on August 4th, 2023. Applications are due on May 4th with exam fees due on July 4th. And if you missed that exam, with, there's another one coming up in February, 2024. Uh, keep an eye on the DPOR website for more details. So in summary of our webinar today, BAWP has been a proponent of this certification since its inception. The PWD is a voluntary certification, but it does demonstrate your expertise in the field of wetland delineation in the state of Virginia. There are requirements that you must meet to sit and qualify for the comprehensive exam. It's a two-year recertification cycle, but it's pretty easy to maintain. And there are 10 standards of practice and conduct that you must follow with this certification. So if anyone has any questions, please send them in the chat. It doesn't look like we've had any come through yet. Um, this is the end of our webinar. Um, if anyone has anything, please send it. And thank you to our sponsors, our speakers, and everyone for joining us today. We have our upcoming spring meeting on May 12th at Lewis Ginter Botanical Gardens in Richmond. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the, the panelists and everyone who's participated. I think it's a, a great event. And um, yeah, if, if people have questions, feel free to reach out to any of us and we'll be helped to direct you to, the, to the, the correct resources. Thank you. Appreciate right. your time and see you at the conference. Yes. All right. I'm shutting the webinar. Thank Thanks, y'all. Thanks.